Hello everyone. Welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for August 15th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Katni, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. What is CircuitPython? It's a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and the folks that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing uh, hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython-dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on uh, Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there is a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about the upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. It contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the document to skip around and view only the parts that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link to the next week's meeting notes document in the CircuitPython-dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can always leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka, which is a statistical oh, overview of the entire project. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good thing folks are up to. Fourth part, status updates. This is an opportunity for us to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes and talk about what you've been doing the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the fifth and final part is in the weeds. This is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can, discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And with that, uh, we will get started with community news. First up, CircuitPython Day, Friday, August 19th. That would be this Friday. Uh, we have the final schedule available. Um, I will not read the whole schedule off, but we have uh, a panel discussion. Um, we have development sprints. Uh, Maker Melissa is going to be doing a project build. We're doing a circuit special edition circuit Python themed show and tell. Scott will be doing a circuit Python eight preview. Uh, there is going to be a circuit Python day chat with Katni, myself, Jeff, and Dan. And uh, Foamy Guy is going to be doing a circuit Python day game jam stream. A uh, special note about the show and tell. Uh, the format is a little bit different. Um, the concept is exactly the same. However, folks will have uh, five minutes to discuss their projects, which is twice as long at least um, as the typical show and tell. And that's because we have more time. Um, so feel free to come by with your CircuitPython project and show it off um, and know that you will have the opportunity if you would like it to get into a little more detail than you would on the typical Wednesday show and tells. There are two other events. Uh, one is reimagining IoT deployments with CircuitPython from Blues Wireless. And uh, the other one is CircuitPython Night at i3 Detroit, which is a makerspace in Ferndale, Michigan. And they are doing a local um, CircuitPython uh, event. So you can check out the Adafruit blog um, for more details on this. Uh, and the final schedule is posted there as well. Um, at this point, uh, if you still have ideas, please let us know, but the, the schedule is pretty much set. Um, so feel free to come by and definitely, if you have projects you wanna show off, uh, join us on Show and Tell. All right, next up, Python gains 2% remains top programming language. Unstoppable Python once again ranked number one in the August updates of both the TOB and Pipel, I guess, indexes of programming language popularity. Uh, new browser-based microbit Python editor launching in September. The new microbit editor runs in a browser, so it's quite different to Thani or Mew. It will be launched in September, but the beta is online now and can be used. And there is a link to that 
uh, in the notes. Uh, next up are a couple projects. Uh, a headband with a surprise LED matrix hidden inside, all programmed in CircuitPython. And here is a quote from the Twitter thread. Made with, an, with Adafruit NeoPixel strips, an Adafruit Cutie Pie, and a LiPo BFF. The diffusion layer is some black tool wrapped in scrunched up layers, and I was really pleased with how it turned out. And finally, uh, this is also a quote, my little Pico Step Seek MIDI sequencer is getting better. Now you can save and load sequences while running and without missing a beat. So this uh, community news section is a preview of the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter, which is a community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, to contribute your own news or project, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub, which is uh, github.com slash adafruit slash circuit python dash weekly dash newsletter and, or and submit a pull request or you can tag a tweet with hashtag circuit python on twitter or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com and that is community news next up the state of circuit python libraries and blinka this is a statistical overview of the project uh, which gives us a chance to look at the project by the numbers and get an idea of where it's at outside of what we're all up to. I will read uh, the section overall, which covers the whole project, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, the core, the libraries, and Blinka uh, individually after that. So overall, we have 57 pull requests merged by 22 authors. A few names I've not seen before are TC Franks, Takayoshi Otake, Retired Wizard, Strider 21, Sis, Socratisfas, and Sikosi Git. The rest of the names I recognize. Um, and we had eight reviewers on those 57 pull requests, which is great. Uh, there were 45 issues closed by 10 people and 21 opened by 18 people. So we are down. I imagine that was almost entirely uh, in the core, um, but I could be wrong. Um, but that's, that's where we are overall. And with that, uh, Scott, if you're available to talk about the core, I will turn it over to you. Yes. Let me stall while I find my tab. <laughs> okay. Numbers for the core. Uh, we had 34 pull requests merged, which is a lot. So awesome. Uh, we had 16 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. I won't read off the individuals. Uh, we had five reviewers, so thank you to all of our reviewers. Um, we have 16 open pull requests, and the oldest is 186 days old, which is better. Uh, the 300 plus day old one I closed and implemented, so that's cool. Um, I will reiterate that a lot of these open pull requests are for specific boards. Um, they have the board label on them. If you have those boards, please uh, drop in and test and maybe polish up those uh, pull requests, uh, because uh, those of us in the core have access to Adafruit boards, but not necessarily third-party boards. Um, so that's a hugely helpful way that people can help. Um, Issues-wise, we had 25 closed issues by 5 people and 14 opens by 12 people. Uh, so we're net down 11, which is awesome, for a total of 551 open issues. Uh, the way that we keep track of kind of priorities for Adafruit-funded folks is through milestones. Um, we have 35 open issues on the 8.0 milestone, which is down like 15 from last week, something like that. Uh, so we're making good progress trying to get towards uh, 8.0 beta um, this week for CircuitPython Day, I think would be cool. Um, and we have four issues not assigned to milestone, so those are the ones that we need to triage. Um, and we have no open issues for 7.3x, so it seems like 7.3 is doing pretty well. And that's uh, the current state of the core. Thanks, Scott. Next up, mm -hmm. I will talk about the libraries. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything uh, beginning with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras such as the community bundle and our cookie cutter. 
across all of these repositories, we had 23 pull requests merged from seven authors and five reviewers. I'm very excited to see that six of the closed pull requests were nearly two weeks or older, up to um, three of them being a month old. So I'm glad to see we're still getting through uh, some older PRs. That leaves us with 27 open pull requests. Uh, we had 20 closed issues by six people and seven opened by six people, leaving us with 666 open issues. 175 of those are labeled good first issue. If you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, um, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of the open pull requests and all of the open issues listed out. And if you are new to everything, check out Good First Issues. We have a guide to contributing on to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. And uh, we are always available on Discord to help. So don't let the process intimidate you. We always want to make sure that you can contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, which was MAX 1704X. And in terms of updated libraries, literally every library was updated. I did not list five pages of libraries in the notes. Um, if you're interested in seeing the whole list of libraries, check out the bundle or the um, library report. <laughs> and with that, I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had zero pull requests merged. Um, there are currently four open pull requests. There were zero closed issues. Um, and we currently have, and there were zero opened. And we currently have 79 open issues amongst all the repositories. Uh, there were 10,508 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are currently at 89 boards, although I think there's been a couple since then, so they just need to be updated. Nice. And that's where we're at. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. All right. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to call folks out for the amazing things they're doing in our community and uh, for recognizing the awesome things that folks are up to. Um, this section is held as round robin. I will start and then I will go through the list, uh, reading off folks who are text only or missing the meeting and turning it over to folks that are here. Um, so with that, I will get started. I have a huge list today. Um, so first up, I have a hug report to maker Melissa for merging a time sensitive PR when the other person who could help was out. Uh, to Tectric for moving all of the libraries from setup.py to pyproject.toml, to Eva for doing the subsequent release sweep, also to Tectric for fixing the Adabot library report when we were struck by a ghost. Um, I wish it was a joke, it's not. Uh, it turns out if someone deletes their account on GitHub, it gets replaced with a ghost. Um, and we had never encountered this before when checking the issues and users on them um, and so on. So it returns none through the API, but it, it shows up still in, in GitHub. Um, and so we had to update it to be able to deal with um, the non type object, uh, but still struck by a ghost. Okay. So uh, to Lady Ada for teaching me how to use the Nordic PPK2 uh, Power Profiler Kit and to use ESP tool to create a bin of the board contents. And now is my CircuitPython day roundup. Uh, to Paul Cutler for all the work he's put into the CircuitPython day panel discussion and for agreeing to take on the official CircuitPython day introduction. To Melissa for doing her first live stream. To Liz for hosting the special edition show and tell and handling all the prep work for that. To Scott for doing a CircuitPython 8 preview. To Dan and Jeff for joining me for another chat stream this year to Tim for doing a Game Jam stream and for being so flexible about the timing when I was putting together a very difficult schedule. To Tectric for taking on hosting the CircuitPython dev sprint and for recording a sprint row video with me. A group hug to everyone who agreed to help Tectric out with the sprint. To Anne for agreeing to keep up the blog and Twitter up to date with everything going on as it happens. 
to Mr. Certainly for agreeing to help out and moderate in the chats during the streams. A group hug to everyone planning to join us on Show and Tell, and to Phil for making time last week to meet with me to finalize a few things. And finally, a group hug to the community for continuing to make all of this possible. And next up is Charles. Ooh, okay, hold on. Sorry. I was no not worries. prepared. There we go. You muted, Charles. How's that? Now I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to give a group hug to all of those who, all of those people who are, are have created the Circuit Python Day. I I missed the one last year, and I really got to make sure I do not miss the one this year. It sounds like a good, good bunch of items to listen to and maybe even participate in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up is Dan. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thanks to Paul Cutler for organizing the Circuit Python Day panel. This has been repeated several times by other people here. Thanks to Scott for working full blast on ADO issues before he takes his paternity leave. Thanks to Lee, who's working on a bulk analog in feature, and we've been working with them on this. It sounds really interesting, and I appreciate their being patient with us while they learn all about the insides of Circuit Python. And thanks to the Adafruit internal developers who did a big update on the Adafruit um, forums, uh, updating the internal software and the software that it depended on. So it will look a little different. If you have problems, let people know. You've seen blog posts about that, but it was a lot of work and we really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from Dave and Glauda to Foamy Guy for exploring the self-hoster runner idea in his stream and to Maker Melissa for helping with the CircuitPython-org pull request. Next up is Tashipu. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff for working on the camera code again. So we have a completely new one now. And for helping me yesterday with my janky camera setup. And uh, I'd like to thank TechTrick Tech and Katni for running up people for the sprints so that we can help uh, running that. So. Thank you. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Thanks, Katni. Uh, and this week, a uh, hug report for David G for sharing the uh, ideas about self hosted runners and pointing to some good resources to start learning about those. To Nerdoc for uh, creating and uh, publishing uh, the tool called uh, Disco Tool for finding connected CircuitPython devices, um, echoing a couple other folks. So thank you to Paul Cutler for preparing and organizing the panel for CircuitPython Day, as well as the other things uh, on CircuitPython Day, and then a group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thanks, funny guy. Next up is Kmatch. Thanks, Katni. I've got one hug this week, not necessarily CircuitPython related, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a hug to Sean Heimel for introductory videos on free RTOS, real-time operating system. If anybody's interested, there's a great uh, starting point. Within an hour, you can know a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks. Excellent. Next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, I wanted to give... Oh, I lost the section here. I want to give a hug to Neurodoc for fixing the web workflow characters with emojis. A hug to Liz and Ketney for getting me set up and running with StreamYard. A hug to Liz for co-hosting Show and Tell with me and group hug to everyone else. Great. Next, I have notes from Mark Gambler. A uh, hug report to me for organizing CircuitPython Day and to Kay Stilson and I am Redacted for their work on I squared C target for RP2040 and a group hug. Next up is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Katni. I have a hug for you for all your work on CircuitPython Day and a group hug. Excellent. Next up is Tammy Makes Things. 
Thanks. So I have a hug for you, Katni, for organizing CircuitPython Day and for TechTrick for coordinating the dev sprints for CircuitPython Day and then a group hug for the community. Thanks. All right, next up is Scott. Hello, uh, this is my last meeting in a while, so I'm gonna try to th thank forwards a little bit. Uh, first, thank you to Foamy Guy for taking a crack at the on-device testing. It looks promising and uh, starting small, which I think is the real trap. Uh, so I'm excited for that. Uh, thanks again uh, to Katni for organizing CircuitPython Day. I won't be able to say that next week, so uh, saying it now. Uh, thank you to everyone for participating in CircuitPython Day. I think this is going to be the best one yet. Um, so I'm excited about that. And uh, just an early hug for everyone who helps keep CircuitPython going, even when I'm out. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to see this community continue um, even when I'm taking leave. So thank you all. All right. Next up, I have notes from TechTrick. Uh, first up, a hug for me for help with preparing for CircuitPython Day. To Foamy Guy for reviewing some PRs uh, TechTrick had submitted a few weeks ago. Uh, Foamy Guy again for working on the memory usage quantification issue. Uh, to the volunteers that have agreed to help out with the CircuitPython development sprint and a group hug. And rounding it out, I have notes from Tom F., who has a hug for me, Tectric, and Foamy Guy for patience with my growing pains working on annotations contributions. And that is hug reports. Next up is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity for us to sync up on what we've been up to since the last meeting and what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. It's an opportunity to provide tips and tricks for stuff people are working on um, and uh, to help with quick questions. If uh, And remember, if a, a conversation ends up extending uh, longer than makes sense for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds and continue on. I will start and then I will go through the list in the notes doc, uh, similar to hard reports. So uh, let's see. Last week, I learned to use the Nordic PPK2 to get power graphs for guides. Previously, to do the low power templates, I had to get that information from Lemoore, and no longer do I have to do that. I started the S3 TFT feather guide. We apparently missed that one, uh, so we are tucking it in now. Um, and continued CircuitPython day planning. This week, continue on the S3 TFT guide. Um, I need to update the I2S template um, to uh, not use discontinued hardware. And uh, I'll be meeting with folks throughout the week to finalize CircuitPython day things as needed. And then next up is the STEMIQT update for the quad alphanumeric display backpack. And after all of that is done, um, a quad alphanumeric display event countdown. Um, and this week is obviously CircuitPython day. So Friday is all things CircuitPython, um, live streams galore. And uh, that's pretty much it. Shorter list than usual um, because this uh, S3 TFT guide, uh, we actually put in all the templates we created. And it turns out that's a lot more work um, <laughs> than not adding all the templates. So uh, this one's going to take me a little longer than usual, uh, but it is definitely an indicator of how long it's going to take moving forward um, because uh, we created those templates to put into board guides. That was the whole point. So we should be doing it moving forward. All right, next up is Dan. Okay, I've been working on a lot of 800 issues. Uh, so these are kind of miscellaneous. Um, we've changed the I2C terminology from, uh, we have a, a module I2C peripheral and a class I do see peripheral. Uh, the official terminology turns it turns out was recently changed to target. That is controller and target. So controllers like the microcontroller and the target is say the I two C sensor. This does not mean the I two C peripheral on the chip, which is the electronics that talks I two C. So uh, we're adding I two C target as an alias for I two C peripheral, or it's really kind of the other way around. Uh, that uh, and um, so both names will be in 800. They point to the same thing internally, and then uh, we'll in 900 we'll drop I2C peripheral, and the name will just be I2C target uh, to correspond with the latest terminology. Um, I restored Rainbow IO and One IO to a bunch of boards because we now have space for them, and restored a couple of modules 
few more modules to some other boards because there's space. I increased the C stack size on espressive boards. It was 8K and we made it 16K. That should fix some stack overflow errors, particularly um, the regular expression module uses recursive calls to do things. And so if you have a long string, it tends to run out of stack space. Um, I enabled the web workflow on the Feather Huzzah 32. Uh, that was just an oversight on my part when I didn't have the, uh, on the original pull request for the Huzzah 32. Um, in MicroPython, uh, there was a PR to MicroPython which fixed um, some floating point printing and formatting idiosyncrasies where like you'd get a lot of zeros or the numbers would be off, seemed, would seem to be off by a little bit. And that was because it was doing floating point arithmetic internally when it could use fixed to get more exact printing. So we cherry picked that in from MicroPython instead of waiting for uh, the next time we merge from MicroPython because this is important and a nice fix and it's simple to bring in. Um, in display IO, I removed support internally and externally for auto brightness um, because it was we had sort of had latent support. The original idea was that there would be a sensor on boards and it would adjust the brightness automatically, but it wasn't never really implemented, and uh, it caused various problems. And we just took it out. Um, and then uh, another thing that we're doing for 800 is to take out passing a PWM out to pulse out, now you can only pass in a pin. So uh, in 700, you could do either. And so we took it out in eight. Uh, Scott uh, had a PR for that. And I went through the learn guide and library code and, and fixed all of them so they're 700 and 800 compatible now instead of being back compatible to 600. And I will continue to fix 800 issues. We're doing really well in terms of fixing things down from like uh, 30, 50 to 35 um, issues. So we're getting a lot closer to 800, which is nice. OK, that's it. Thanks, Dan. Next up, I have notes from David Glada, who says, in CircuitPython, I fixed uh, seed in capital letters to seed studio and the new naming for the shell board on circuitpython.org. Non-CircuitPython tested Whippersnapper on an S3 TFT to capture data from my SCD30, which is a CO2 sensor. Next up is Deshipu. OK, so I worked a little bit on this PNG support for uh, the image load library, but uh, I ran into problems with uh, type annotations. And I need to read a little bit about type annotations in Python to be able to figure out how to actually properly write those. So this will take some time and there will be a delay on that. And uh, also with the gesture sensor I was working on, I uh, still have some problems with... Uh, it works in full light, but uh, it doesn't work or works very poorly in, in uh, artificial light. So I, I still need to figure out how to properly set the registers on it to, to make it uh, more reliable. That's it. All right, excellent. Next up is Foamy Guy. Right, uh, I had limited activity in the early part of next week. I was still out from vacation. Uh, once I did get back and get back into the swing of things though, um, what I worked on was uh, mostly things centered around memory quantification. So I have a couple of C Python scripts that measure the size of MPY files and uh, also the strings contained within those MPY files. And I worked on integrating those with actions so we could see those get printed out automatically for each PR uh, or push or anything like that. Um, I also created some other scripts, which are also C Python. They run on a PC, but they connect with serial to a circuit Python device that's plugged in, and they measure the amount of memory that's consumed uh, when you import a specific library using the GC module. Um, I made a proof of concept that would trigger that memory uh, measurement to happen from a WebSocket. So a, a client would connect to a WebSocket and just wait for a new uh, trigger uh, to come in and then do the measurement and send the result back. Um, and then 
uh, the next day after that, I tested out kind of a different approach to that using self-hosted runners uh, for GitHub Actions, which is um, it will allow us to do those memory measurements, but not really need like the WebSockets or the same stuff in between. Um, this week, uh, so far this morning, I've done a lot of PR reviews and I've got a stack of others for testing this afternoon with some devices that I need to pull out. Um, I need to take uh, one or two more uh, photos and then get them into the Octopus Guide and submit the final version today. Um, I am going to continue working on uh, some ideas around on-device testing and memory uh, measurement this week. And then the uh, last thing I have uh, that I know of so far is going to be uh, working back into the uh, the hack tablet land, specifically trying to troubleshoot the dot clock display um, core issues that pop up when the device resets. Um, and then, of course, uh, Circuit Python Day is on Friday, so I'll have my stream uh, for that. That's what I have. Thank you. Great. Next up is Kmatch. Thanks, Katni. Uh, last week, uh, mainly worked on uh, work and caught up with uh, where I need to be there. And also related, uh, learned some about ultra wideband positioning and uh, related uh, real time operating system to work with that. Uh, but this week, hope to get back into the bowling training aid uh, project now that I got some sonar sensors. So I want to test if those can detect the position of a high speed passing bowling ball. We'll see how it goes. Thanks. You are welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mika Melissa. Hi, uh, this last week I finished up the second phase of adding web workflow functionality to code.circuitpython.org by adding a huge update that adds all the essential stuff and that is now merged in. Um, I tested out the Arduino RA8875 example code for a user to verify that it's still working. Um, and then I started on, working on the third phase of adding the web workflow to code.circuitpython.org. And I also co-hosted my first show and tell with Liz on Wednesday. Uh, this week, I'm going to be preparing for my first ever live stream this Friday uh, by working on the code for the project that I'll be showing. Also, I'm um, preparing by making sure my computer setup is working well, though I may need to have a backup of the flaky office internet isn't working again like it hasn't really been since Wednesday. Um, possibly... Uh, I'll do a little work here and there on code.circuitpython.org if Scott finds some quick things. And uh, I'll be co-hosting Show and Tell again, but this time in more like the greeter role. And I'll be actually doing the live streaming project for CircuitPython Day on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And other than that, I've been finally walking for the first time uh, over the last week since my surgery a couple of months ago. Uh, and that's pretty much made my energy levels plummet to almost non-existent lately. And that's where I'm at. Good to hear that you're walking, though. Well, thank you. All right. Next up, I have notes from Mark Ambler. He says, uh, submitted a PR for I2C target on RP2040. Helped some community members, uh, Kay Stilson and I am redacted, uh, mentioned in the hug reports work on this functionality, so I have done basic tests only as I did not have a specific use. And found a small bug in the IS31FL3741 code that he'll PR eventually. It does not affect the glasses, only the matrix, so it's less likely to come up. Next up is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Katni. Uh, last week, I prepped the next two episodes of the podcast with Brent Rubel and Deshipu, so look for those over the next few weeks. Um, finalized all the panel questions and wrote the first draft of the kickoff. And that's what I'll be focusing on this week is uh, working on the script to kick off CircuitPython Day. Thanks. Excellent. Next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So last week um, was performance appraisal week at work, and I had to do performance appraisals for all of my teams, so I didn't do any CircuitPython stuff. Um, this week is CircuitPython Day, and... So that's what I'm going to be working on and not CircuitPython related, but I'm excited. I've been teaching myself um, baritone ukulele, and I'm at a point now where I need some professional guidance so that I don't create bad habits in myself. So my first lesson with an actual music teacher is this Friday, and I'm excited about that. And that's what I've got. Very cool. All right. Next up is Scott. 
Hello. Uh, like I said before, this is my last week before 12 weeks of paternity leave. Puts me into like mid-November, so be aware of that. I'm also out Thursday uh, because technically my partner goes back on Thursday for work, so uh, she's taking Friday off so that I can do CircuitPython Day, so I'm taking Thursday off so she can go to work on Thursday. Um, so let me know if you want to chat before I'm out. Um, otherwise, I'm going to try to disconnect as much as I can. Um, on CircuitPython Day, I'm helping with the core sprints and streaming this uh, CircuitPython 8 preview. Um, I need to, well, I'll need to come up with a list for that. Um, I need to add a move API to the web workflow. It's like the last little piece, I think, I'm, uh, that's kind of like definitely missing. Um, I want to update TinyUSB because there was a bug fix for NRF that I'm very curious to see if it'll fix a bug I've seen on NRF for years now. Um, I'm going to get to testing code.circuitpython.org today. I'm very, very excited about that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and then I'm just going to bug fix as much as I can before I'm out, which is, is not, not that long. So we'll see what I can do. Uh, that's my plan. All right. Finally, I have notes from Tactric. Last week, migrated all the libraries to PyProject.toml. Some neat things came alongside the migration. <clears throat> all libraries that define the Dunder version attribute can be accessed with libname.dunderversion, uh, such as adafruit underscore bme 680dunder version, which hopefully will help with support and debugging. This wasn't true beforehand if the library was installed from PyPI via pip. Problem mashers are fixed for the CIs, so the CI should give clearer, more recognizable responses when failing, which should help alleviate some of the parser reviewers and submitters, uh, parsing reviewers and submitters have to do currently. Requirements now have a single home in requirements.txt instead of two places like before. Optional dependencies only used in examples or optional features such as pillow can now be put in the new optional requirements.txt. These can be downloaded using uh, pip install, Library name bracket optional close bracket. Pure Python wheels built distribution are uploaded to PyPI, which should cut down on install time since packages won't need to be built from source distributions after downloading. Source distributions are still uploaded for redundancy. Uh, other things submitted a PR for Adafruit IO updates, fixed the Adabot reporting errors, and submitted a draft for a fix to CircuitPython.org library infrastructure issues list now pending a few more additions and getting it to pass uh, CI. This week, uh, Naradoc raised a good point that the current version string that gets replaced isn't uh, PEP 440 compliant, so a patch to the libraries would help with the manual and editable installs of the repository via PIP. Uh, finalize the library infrastructures fix and hosting the CircuitPython Day Sprint. Come and join and hack away at issues. And that is status updates. Next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. Uh, I see we already have uh, two topics, which is excellent. Um, the way it goes is I will turn it over to the person who posted the topic, um, and they can talk about it, and then other folks can jump in to help out with answers and so on. If you have an In the Weeds topic, please get it added while we're talking about the other topics um, so we're not waiting around at the end, uh, which is to say we won't wait around. Um, so add your topics if you have them. So first up, I'm going to turn it over to Foamy Guy to talk about uh, his and weeds issue. Thanks, Katni. Um, so I have been uh, looking into the you know generally the idea of on-device testing. Um, specifically, I'm starting with looking at how much memory a library takes, but we can of course branch out from there. Um, and I've come to a bit of a fork in the road. We have two kind of pretty high-level options for ways um, that this could work. So I wanted to kind of describe them both and what I understand about pros and cons and see if anybody else had uh, any um, opinions on which, which way might make the most sense for us. So um, one of the ways that I got this working was with uh, GitHub Actions self-hosted runners. Um, so basically what this is, is GitHub allows you to use your own PC or Raspberry Pi as an Actions runner. So you download a thing, you run a little script, and then essentially your computer uh, will be eligible to receive uh, tasks that need to get executed inside of GitHub Actions. And you can set it up such that only certain uh, specific tasks will go to it um, and not everything. So in our case, you know, the tasks that deal with on-device testing would be 
arced to go to these self-hosted runners, whereas all the normal stuff we do today, like building and building docs and all that stuff, would just keep using the existing uh, VMs inside GitHub. Um, this was was pretty straightforward uh, to set up. So in in terms of uh, pros, like I did, I did feel like it was pretty easy to get up and running. I got this tested on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, with a CircuitPython device connected, and I was able to get a, an actions task to successfully interact with that device and uh, spit out some information that it got from it. Um, the, the infrastructure to do this already exists, obviously, so GitHub Actions, we're already using it. We already have a bunch of stuff set up with it. Um, adding your own Raspberry Pi or PC isn't too much more uh, work, and it relies on that existing GitHub infrastructure. Um, it's also very versatile. Um, you know, if uh, those of you that are familiar with Actions, you probably know GitHub Actions can do almost anything. You can set it up to just run uh, arbitrary Linux commands, or you can clone other repos to have it run more specific actions and stuff like that. So uh, there's plenty of opportunity to branch um, outwards and evolve like what specific tests we want to do on the devices as time goes on. Um, we can start start very basic and never worry about um, really running into a ceiling or anything as far as like what we can do on the devices, um, which is definitely really nice. In terms of cons, though, I was reading around on the documentation a bit for these self-hosted runners, and it looks like GitHub really pretty strongly recommends not to use the self-hosted runners except for on private repositories uh, because pull requests, which can be made by members of the public, can um, trigger the actions to run, and in particular, a pull request could change the actions and then still automatically trigger them to run in some cases, uh, meaning that somebody could execute, you know, arbitrary code essentially on that self-hosted runner. Um, in the existing infrastructure, this is also true, but because those are like VMs that disappear um, after the actions is done, the the risk is kind of mitigated in that way. Whereas, of course, the self-hosted runner. Um, you can try to take steps to isolate it on the network or isolate it as its own uh, OS without other stuff on it, but um, it doesn't get deleted in the same way directly afterwards. So there's always some risk of it doing something and, and additional stuff remaining behind. Um, so one one thing that I thought of is I, I think we had this issue pop up before where GitHub, we were having some folks put in pull requests to run malicious actions code. Um, and I know at one point in time, at least, there was a thing where it was like you had to approve the actions flow if it was um, not a, you know, if it wasn't an existing contributor or like member of a group with write access or something like that, um, then it would wait for you to approve the actions. I don't know if that's like on across the board or if GitHub just does that automatically uh, certain times and not other times or what. Um, but that's something to look into and think about. If we do go this route of self-hosted runners, I would think almost certainly we probably want to do that to where uh, only existing contributors can trigger those self-hosted actions to run automatically. Um, that's kind of the food for thought on that side of things. And then uh, the other option, which kind of gets us away from using the GitHub actions uh, directly, the self-hosted runners, at least, we still trigger our stuff uh, via GitHub actions. So that that portion of the workflow still works the same. but Instead of having self-hosted runners, uh, we could create a custom piece of infrastructure that kind of acts as a go between uh, between the actions tasks and our uh, device testers. So those Raspberry Pis or PCs that we hook up, um, we could build our own server that sits in the middle and basically waits for HTTP requests to come in. Uh, those requests will come in from GitHub Actions, and then it can be forwarded along to the device testers um, via WebSockets or long polling or some other technology that will kind of send that trigger down to the, the device tester, uh, which can then you know execute the test via a measurement of memory or whatever else, uh, get the result, and then return it back to the server, which can ultimately return it back to that initial um, requester. Um, the pros in on this side is it's much more restricted. It's It's not open to just arbitrary. Uh, commands of whatever you want to put into it, we basically lock it down to where certain triggers are possible uh, and any other kind of trigger that somebody tries to send to it just gets ignored. So um, it will only ever do the specific things we set it up to do, um, which is a pro from the security side, but of course kind of a con from the um, uh, you know evolving side of things, right? Because then if we want to add new uh, functionalities, new possibilities, we probably will have to um, do some work inside of that infrastructure layer as well to add the new type of command or whatever it is that we want to um, 
add on to it. And then of course the other major con is like, it, it doesn't exist that I know of so far today. So like we'd have to build whatever this in between thing is and uh, of course maintain it and keep it running, probably put it hosted uh, on a server somewhere to run. So um, I wanted to kind of share the, the findings I've got so far and just see if either uh, one of those made any more sense uh, we thought from kind of the whole project's perspective. See, Tectric says, can we have those workflows be uh, approval only, save sending jobs uh, that don't affect memory size? Uh, Adafruit IO does that too, I saw. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, if there is an existing uh, mechanism that makes it so that, uh, and I, I'm not positive if I have the right terminology, so uh, forgive me if I don't, but I'm going to say a task. Um, but but maybe what I mean as a job or a workflow, truthfully, I don't, I'm not super clear on how what the different layers are, but... Uh, if there is a thing that exists today that lets you limit it to uh, needing to be approved only, um, then we could do that. It just would depend on how does that approval work. Because if it's like a, it's kind of this catch-22 is like, if that is configured inside the workflow file, um, and they can, of course, just change the workflow file and push uh, to a branch and trigger the PR to run it. So it would need to be like in settings or somewhere inside GitHub that the user wouldn't have access to. I believe it's possible. Um, Okay, that would be, I think that would be best. I, I think the actions, the self-hosted runner um, seems like the much easier option. Um, certainly the, the, you know, the less work we can do building this in-between thing and maintaining it and hosting it somewhere, I think is uh, uh, pretty helpful. Um, but I also don't, I, I do think we ultimately, this effort depends on members of the community uh, being willing to like plug in their devices and set them up to be one of these runners for us. So um, I definitely want to make sure that we're not going to be putting those people at, at risk in that situation. So, Yeah, uh, Tim, I do have a suggestion for that. Uh, I've been working with a RISC-5 uh, big cluster in China, and uh, the one of the things that we cannot uh, use the, the self-runner code from GitHub because that thing is wrote is written in uh, .NET, and Microsoft is still not interested in importing .NET to to RISC Five. So while I was uh, looking for alternatives, I found th that one that I put in the chat, which is called GARM, and uh, that's actually written in Go, I think it is. And one of the cool things is that you can actually uh, invoke your own containers based on LXC. And there's also the infrastructure and the examples on how to run whatever type of container you prefer. Um, and the good thing is that this thing actually works like the GitHub uh, internal actions. So you create a, a container, the container runs all of your code, and then it disappears. And when you run another one, uh, uh, a new one is going to get created. So it's more, uh, it's it's easier on the security uh, side uh, type of things. Uh, you still need to uh, put at least some protection for the outside of the network, so that you don't create like a like a denial of service or or a privacy disclosure of your network or something like that. But uh, normally for running code, uh, it's, uh, it's it's nicer. So uh, yeah, th this example works uh, more than fine. And if you need any help, uh, that thing is like a like a complete tutorial. But if you need more help, I'll be happy to help you uh, set, set one up. OK, yeah, that's awesome. I will definitely look into this one. Just to make sure I understand, too, though, so it, it creates these containers. Is that inside of like a local machine? So you could run this on your local PC or something like that? Um, yeah, so these... okay. yeah, so so let's say you have an, an Ubuntu machine, and that Ubuntu machine will create another container inside of it called an LXC, which is, uh, let's say that it's a step in between uh, Docker and, and uh, just a normal CH root. Uh, they're very uh, tiny containers, uh, even tinier than, than Docker, let's say. Uh, but yeah, some people have already run it with Docker containers or whatever, so it, it's really easy to, let's say, run something on Debian or run something on SUSE or run something on, on whatever you, you want it to, uh, as long as there's already a, a created container. And if you need to create a specialized container, uh, it's as easy as creating Docker containers. So yeah, it's, it's very easy to have it. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll have to do some reading up on it. I don't have too much experience with um, Docker's and the containerizing aspect of it, but I'll definitely look into that. And that does sound like it would be ideal if we can have it uh, kind of work the same way where it creates the container and just destroys it. One potential gotcha is we do still have to make sure that our container can have access to the USB, um, you know, basically the serial connection to the device, since ultimately that's what we're 
trying to interact with, but I guess there probably will be some way that that could pass through. Yeah, all of that layer is completely easy to to actually give the permissions to. Uh, so yeah, just uh, s send me the task. Uh, I need a container that does this and this and this, and I'll be happy to create it for you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. Uh, David also asked uh, one other question: If you want members, basically, do we want members of the community to offer the runner uh, by dedicating a device to it, or have only Adafruit host the infrastructure? Um, if you want contribution, they'll have to deal with onboarding, uh, saying what's connected to the runner. Yeah, which is definitely a good question. Um, I had imagined it at least to start with being just members of the community and members of the development team, probably. Um, I think a lot of us probably have extra either Raspberry Pis or computers that we could just leave connected and leave turned on um, and run those. But I do think there is a possibility down the line where it might make sense for Adafruit to uh, own or at least maintain one uh, setup of that infrastructure. But um, I figured to start with, that would probably be like a community type of a, a thing. Uh, let's see. Keith also says, what about a different approach? Pull request workflow uh, works as it is right now, but then once a week jobs run over everything and raises an issue. If a recent pull request expands the memory beyond the threshold, this would alleviate uh, the need to always to have the job always ready to run hosted on a third party machine but it's entirely a different idea so maybe it's more of a detraction uh, than it is helpful i have thought on that um on that front as well uh keith so it is it is a good idea and it's something to keep in mind basically flipping the script a little bit and instead of trying to do this measurement or this testing uh right whenever the pull request gets created uh, instead, we have some schedule, like Adabot already runs a series of reports daily, and I think a different series of reports weekly or something. Um, we could add a, a report to that that will basically check all the libraries and run the stats on them and output a report somewhere, um, in which case we could pick it up after the fact rather than right when the PR is submitted, which um, I do think something like that would be helpful for the existing libraries. Um, but I do wonder, like, I think there will be times for PRs where it might, yeah, like David's mentioning, where it might be too late. So you, uh, somebody puts in a PR and it gets reviewed and merged before that weekly um, thing, or, or even daily, if we, if we run it daily, um, just before that, that scheduled job to um, do the testing runs, essentially. But um, I, I definitely think there is value in running a, a wholesale report against all the libraries, uh, in addition to the work that I've been doing, trying to get measurement whenever a PR is submitted. Uh, I think both of those can definitely be helpful to us. So I think from my side, what what is your goal of doing on device? Did you compare MPY usage stats versus on device stuff? Yeah, so far, um, I am just trying to print that information out, but then at some point we could add filters into the actions that say like, if it raises by more than X amount, then it can right. trigger the actions to fail or something. Um, but yeah, I have it printing actual size of the MPY file, um, the size of the strings within the MPY file. And then the latest one is just basically doing an import um, on the device in the REPL then getting calls from gc.memalloc and returning the results of subtracting those. So basically, right. the yeah, we're able to compare the size of the memory that it consumes on the device or, or the amount that it thinks it consumes uh, compared to the size of the MPY file. Yeah, I think, I think my feedback would be that for this particular problem of MPY size tracking, I don't think having an on-device testing setup is what you want because it's a huge pain. Right, it's it's a huge pain to maintain devices, or and or a server. Like, I would I would really push for going towards tests like the MPY stuff that we can automate and roll out and understand before we think about doing on device stuff. Um, and I also think that for on device testing, it has a lot of benefits, but those benefits are actually like. If we had a standard set of sensors that we were connected to and we actually did want to like exercise hardware peripheral stuff, I think that's where a lot of a lot of the benefit of of on device testing could be. Um, so I guess I'm saying that this stuff's really cool and I would definitely go self-hosted actions runner or what um, Fede2 pointed out as well. But I think 
I would like to see... I, I think it, there's a lot of value to doing the NPY analysis and automating that and integrating that into our workflows before we before we spend too much time on on, de, on device testing. Okay. Um, in terms of those on on that side of it, is it uh, what is the best next step? Because I do have a proof of concept mm -hmm. that will print the MPY file size. Does it make sense to PR like a cookie cutter or somewhere to so that that's like yeah, I think yeah, I, I think I think cookie cutter having an issue or a PR there is really good. I think yeah, I think you're you, you're like me the 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 technical stuff's really fun, but the rollout is like the 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 tedious work. Um, but I th I think that yeah, a PR to cookie cutter and starting to get it on repos so that we can kind of put up that roadblock. Um, based on MPY size, it would be really, really helpful. Okay. And, and I think a lot in a lot of cases, it'll catch what we're talking about. Um, would it make the most sense to just have it like print into the actions output for now, or do we want to have it try to leave a comment or anything? I don't know. What's the basically the best way for it to report its results? I think. I think for me. The, the thing I pay attention to the most is the thing that tells you, like, no, you're too big. <laughs> like, the thing that actually stops you, right? Like, any sort of information is nice to have, but but the reality needs to be, like, you're really growing this library. Are we sure that we want to do that? Um, that sort of thing. I would say okay, for a so... user, um, so that it's, I think, so it's easiest on contributors regardless of whether you want to put it in the actions workflow, that's fine. But I think making a comment is also excellent because not everybody yeah. knows how to read through actions or knows to go to it, even when it fails. Right. So if, if you were to have it also post a comment, I think that would be um, super important for, you know, uh, for, for ease of contributor um, right. interaction. Yeah. And then the, then the reviewer can be the person that says like, Hey, like, can we get this down? Yeah, can we get this exactly. Down? So just pure info, no suggestions. Let let the reviewer make those suggestions. Okay. Yeah, I will get started working down that front. Then I'll get a, a PR over on Cookie Cutter and work in. Um, I'll have to look into doing the comments and stuff like that, and work yeah. in at least a, a stab at the first logic to say like if it grew X amount, then right. um, raise it as more more important or fail the action or something like that. I'll work yeah, I that. think I think Katney's right. I think a comment's enough. Because uh, we do have human reviewers, I think if if it's just a like GitHub bot puts a thing that says, "Hey, by the way, you're adding 200k or 200 bytes of MPY size," like, and and it's mostly in strings or something, right? Like that can be a huge like, "Hey, want you to let you know." Um, yeah, so I think I, I this this on device testing stuff is really interesting, it, and I think for the long-term health of the project, we're going to need to do it. I just want to make sure that we're um, kind of doing it in stages, right? Like starting starting with the stuff where we don't have to maintain it. Like I went there in the first year of CircuitPython and it found some bugs and it was helpful, but it was a huge pain. Yeah, I will, um, I will say well. the process of those self-hosted runners actually made it pretty straightforward. I was very surprised and impressed with um how easy that made it set up and some of the possibilities that we could do yeah. surrounding that. So, yeah. And I was, doing, I wasn't doing library testing. I was doing circuit Python testing. And so I had issues with like Linux USB reliability because oh, yeah. I was like resetting devices and stuff like that. Like, yep. Um, quite familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say this stuff's cool and definitely, I think self hosted runner is the way to go. Um, in the long term, but I think for the short term, let's focus on getting the stuff that doesn't require us to run separate separate infrastructure going first. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, I think that covers um, covers my question. Excellent. Then I will turn it over to Feta too. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, I've been working with the OpenSSF, the Open Sec uh, Source Security Foundation, and they have a very nice tool called Scorecard. Uh, what this tool does is that it reviews the security practices of a particular repository, 
and it has basic things like for example uh, two-factor authentication uh, dependency pinning, uh, binary artifacts to give another example. Um, so yeah, I was kind of uh, asking everybody if, if it's uh, worth to actually start working on Scorecard as a, as a repo. So uh, just a small couple of notes. Uh, Circuit Python already kind of does this. They uh, Right now this, the repository has a uh, score of 5.5 and there's a link over there if you want to see the detailed JSON data that has uh, all of the, the the answers that currently has uh, inside the the, the report. Um, the whole Adafruit right now has an average uh, scorecard of uh, 4.3. I made a small tool that actually uh, uh, checks this, and they're only using it on 4.68 percent of their repositories. So it would be nice to actually get these uh, these three scores uh, a bit higher over time. Um, some of the pros. It's going to improve the security practices of the organization. And of course, all of the collaborators that actually work here are going to learn uh, how to how to work with these uh, security practices. So that for me is like uh, number one. Uh, it's going to remove or at least makes uh, a little bit harder to get some of the attacks, uh, get into the code. Um, this repository already has a lot of good practices. So for example, uh, the CircuitPython already uses a lot of dependency. Uh, a lot of uh, pin dependencies. Um, it also has uh, things like, for example, uh, code reviews, which uh, we have been doing for a lot of time. And uh, uh, for example, to have a license, uh, all of those things are, are part of the, the, the evaluation. Uh, so this will actually kind of celebrate all of those good practices that are already happening. Um, and if there's stuff that we need to learn how to do, uh, that's probably going to end up in a learning guide. And that is also a very good uh, pro. Uh, some of the cons. Um, so, for example, version pinning takes some time to get used to. Uh, as I mentioned, we already have version pinning. We only need to, re to remove it on a couple of places. And this is not going to make it harder for uh, to test like new versions of libraries in this dependency. So it's just kind of like uh, checking that all of the code has a uh, version pinning. Um, it is a gradual process. Uh, something that I would like to comment here is that the the goal is not to get a 10 out of uh, the 5.5 the that we already have. Um, this is, as I mentioned, a gradual process. Uh, the whole idea is to actually get a scorecard of something like 7 is actually a very good uh, score. Uh, we were just celebrating between the community the other day that there's a Python library that got to 9. So that's uh, incredibly uh, high for, for a Python library. And another con... I'm oh, sorry, and something important is that it's going to take time, non-development type from the core developer. So if I'm going to start working on this, I'm going to have to uh, have somebody on the line so that I can ask, hey, uh, how is this uh, release? How can we add a GPG signature to it? I'll give you one example. And uh, the last cons that I have is that the best practices batch is a dependency of scorecard. But this is actually something that's a good thing. So for example, uh, the best practices bash is the one that asks, hey, are you using two-factor authentication for your releases? And this is something that we already are using for things like uh, like being in the Circuit Pythonistas group inside the... Um, inside the... Um, I forgot the name of this tool. Uh, inside of Discord. Discord. Yeah, thank you. And this is also something used already for, um, for the people who want to buy Raspberry Pi uh, cards. So yeah, we're not... Uh, we're not external to things like two-factor authentication. It's just to continue uh, applying these practices on, on this type of repositories. So yeah, thank you. Thoughts? Do anybody has any comments about it? Uh, my take is it seems cool and good. I I can't really sign up for time because I'm about to take leave. Um, so that I think I would delegate to Dan of whether he wants to give you some time of his for that. Um, I is there an HTML version of of that report, the JSON report thing? Yes, sadly no. There is a text file that comes out of the tool, which I can uh, put here in the in the chat, uh, so that you can review it. But yeah, sadly, uh, we're actually working on an HTML version of of this result, but uh, that's that's getting in very slow. Uh, we just passed uh, this API part, so 
in the yeah. past, if you wanted to see your scorecard, you will actually have to run a tool. But yeah, we, we are expecting to have one in like the next next month or so. Yeah, because I, I, I would love to see all the things in there, but I my my uh, new dad brain can't handle looking at the JSON. Um, <laughs> yeah, but maybe a, a tool like JQ might, might be enough for some. So, but yeah. I mean, I, I also think that I, I want to actually like, I think that supply like software supply chain stuff is really interesting and valuable i'm a little worried about going into security land because i don't consider circuit python secure um and i want to make sure that we let people know that are that are using circuit python code itself in in scenarios that could be security sensitive that that they're it's on them to do the diligence to make sure that it matches that it meets their requirements. Um, so I, I, I would say we should still do it, but um, I think that it's it's a tricky balance to, to try to let people know how secure you think something is. And that's with the web workflow and the basic auth, like it's also like, this is a very low bar <laughs> for people getting access to your device. Um, yeah, so, so just to comment here, uh, this is not only for the end product, uh, this is more for like the process. So, for example, right. Uh, right now one of the warnings that the code is that the that the scorecard tool is uh, is saying is that we have uh, two binary tools in uh, the Bosak Linux and the Bosak OS X uh, tools are, are binary artifacts. And so, for example, this is going to improve more the security of the developers because if I download this on my Linux uh, or my Mac uh, box, I'm going to run these binary artifacts. And I really don't know what these artifacts have, or I haven't really checked who put them there in the first place. So the the whole security process is going to actually improve um, the the security of the developers more than the end result. So this is not about checking. Well, a little bit is about checking the code itself, but mostly it's about the the process of of committing to GitHub and doing stuff uh, with GitHub itself. Mm -hmm. Dan, what what is your take? I, I I think it's interesting to look at some of these things. Some of the things that we do might be outside of what like we don't store we don't keep artifacts anymore because they were so large. So we have our own mechanism for doing release artifacts. We upload them to our own private place, and I'm not sure that this handles like that's that's a sort of a, a workflow kind of thing that might not be considered by this um but certainly an audit of what's going on internally is is helpful and i would and i'd like to see that in as easy a form as possible and whether it's done one time or on every release or something it, or on a pr merge is would be interesting because it would be good it would help to catch things so, you know, you say we have this current score, and I don't. I look. I looked at that JSON file, and even not the fact that it was JSON, I didn't understand what some of the things were. So, uh, an explanation would be helpful, and we can work on those things. And I think if you see issues, you can open. It. If you see problems, you can open an issue about it, and we can we can address those, and we could run this tool manually for a while to see what we might improve. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the the tool has already found two binary artifacts, which are the the Bosak tools. So yeah, maybe this could be uh, rebuilt inside the the PR. Uh, and another quick thing that I didn't mention in the in the comments of the the, the document is that uh, there's already a, a GitHub action to actually run scorecard within your tool. So. Uh, yeah, maybe this is a good way to, of starting. So mm -hmm. we could we could just uh, do a, a pull request on on adding this to the GitHub Actions, and yeah, yeah, then we can actually start very very slowly to actually start improving uh, the scorecard uh, one by one. So it, it it would not be like a like a like a huge code review and then just send it, but it would be more like a like a very slow process of hey, you know. Let's add GPG this month, and the next month let's uh, try, try to remove these Bosak tools and things like that. Yeah, yeah, like the Bosak tools. I think they're they were there, put there for convenience. We could probably just remove that. So um, they're not used during the build 
process as far as I know. Right. I so, think they're just for deployment. Yeah. And and most people don't deploy with them anymore anyway. So. Yeah, it's pre-UF2 probably. Yeah, so we could probably just throw that out. But it's good that you found that. It, we can just take it out then. Yeah, I'm We're totally done. open. I'm I'm open to inactions for this. Yeah. So if you if you if you if you would like to point out the pro the problems, we can we can fix them. And and if you want to submit a PR to run this tool, say on release or something, as part of release.yaml or or on a on PRs, as, as, assuming it doesn't take too long to run, which it probably doesn't. Um, that would be great too. So. All for continuing on this. I think that would be that would be fine. It it it, it, it it's only going to make it better. Right. So. Yeah. The other similar thing on my radar is like SPDX li licensing stuff. Yeah. We like we should like. There's clearly a best practice for that now that we are not following, and probably something we should follow. It. Yeah. Open to okay. it. <laughs> Good. So thank you for suggesting this, and mm -hmm. we can take and working out. on it broadly. Yep, we'll, we'll do. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. I think that's uh, that's the end of in the weeds. So it is time to wrap up. Um, let me get to my wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, August 15th, 2022. Thanks you to everyone who participated. If you would like to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Monday, August 22nd, uh, as usual, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting or any changes to the time or day, you can be asked to, add, asked to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>